Amen. Shabbat Shalom. I want to welcome everybody tuning in on the internet. Welcome to the Vineyard. This is Matthew Miller. And we're doing a teaching series for the next six weeks on our foundational teachings uh, for this ministry. And for those new people that are coming, um, the next six weeks we're going to be going over some of these things. Um, I'm not sure. I think this is the order we're going to do. But this will take us right into the fall feasts. Today we're going to be looking at the unity of God. And so if you've been in the Hebrew Roots movement at any length of time, this is a big controversy. Um, you know, coming out of Christianity, and some people even coming out of Catholicism. Um, it's all right. Um, it's a big issue. So we're going to touch on that today. We're going to look at our uh, identity in Christ, which shows that Christians, anyone who's born again is actually adopted into the family of Abraham and considered a part of Israel through adoption, through grafting in. We're going to look at the New Covenant and look how it fits. It's actually a Brit Hadashah, the renewed covenant of Moses on our hearts. Hey, this is how crazy these guys are, man. They actually read Jeremiah 31 and they say, this old covenant was replaced. And then they get to the part where it says, and I will write it on your hearts. And I'm like, uh, did you just read that? Really? But it's done away, but it's on my heart. Okay. We're going to look at the Torah. Um... The names of God, why do we say Yeshua, why do we say Yahweh's name? And uh, God's calendar, and so God's calendar, the last one there, we will um, touch on the pagan holidays a little bit for new people. We'll talk about how we understand God's calendar. We'll look at the differences in the calendar. This will be good for you, Victoria. You were asking questions about the calendar. Um, and, so, um, and then we'll go right into the fall feasts. Uh, this top... In Hebrew, it says Yahweh Echad. Everybody say Yahweh Echad. Yahweh Echad. Now, God's name is pronounced several different ways. Uh, we just say Yahweh here. Okay, you can pronounce it Yahweh, Yah, Yahuvah, you know, Yahuwah. Some people even say Yahuwah, which, which um, you know, however you feel comfortable pronouncing God's name, the key is that you say His name. He has a name, right? His name's not Lord, but it's not bad to say Lord. Right, John? I mean, some people get into this movement and all of a sudden you can't even speak English anymore. <laughs> Everything's pagan. Really? And no, it's not. Even the name of Jesus. We all got saved using that name and it will cast out a true demon can be expelled in that name because it's the person behind the name. We know His name's Yeshua. And that's a good news that we know the truth. Yahweh Echad, in English, most Bibles would translate that the Lord is one. Here's the key for us as we begin to go through this. This is how I understand the Scriptures. So this will be our uh, ministry's understanding of God and the unity of God. There's only one God. Amen. Amen. So, but here's the key for us. He is a unity. Everybody say unity. unity. Within this unity of God is the Father and the Word and the Holy Spirit. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. Um, this says Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. This is from the Shema. Shema Israel. Y'all don't know that. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. Now that word that is there in um, orange is Echad. Everybody say Echad. Echad means it can be translated as one. What it is, it is a unity. It's called a compound unity. Okay. The definition of the word Echad is a compound unity, as when the father, a mother, and a child comprise one family. So do you understand how, like right now, we are one congregation. Understand? But we have many people in here. In a family, there's a family. You get six or eight, you to Campbell's, you're going for the 12 tribes. It's still one family, right? But he's the Campbell's. We call them the Campbellites, right? <laughs> Hey, Charity's the only woman I know that can handle that many children with her sweet, peaceful spirit. <laughs> so listen, um, and we're going to get into this because this one of the main examples is Adam and Eve becoming one flesh. One, right? So what I did here is I separated this um, for us. The top line says Shema Israel. It says, Hear, O Israel, basically. And then we have Yahweh's name, okay? 
Um, that's Yahweh. So it says, um, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh. And then you have this word. This is Eloheinu. Everybody say Eloheinu. And then you have Yahweh again. So in this, just in the Shema, Yahweh is in there how many times? And Eloheinu is in there once. Okay? And then the bottom says they are a unity. Yahweh, Eloheinu, Yahweh, Echad. Okay? Now, the Jewish understanding, now this is coming from Judaism, the Jewish understanding of one God. See, Judaism, modern Judaism, Talmudic Judaism, Pharisaic Orthodox Judaism, most sects, deny that God is any kind of a unity. But what I'm going to show you is this is not based on Torah or even early Jewish writings. This is based on traditions of men just like Christianity has. So let's read this. The Jewish understanding of one God evolves not from the Scriptures but from Maimonides. Okay, he's called Rambam. And he wrote the 13 Articles of Faith. When he formulated these principles, he actually did what Christianity does. He's replacing things. He replaced the word echad, which means unity, and it appears in the Bible and means unity. He put the word yachid. Everybody say yachid. Yachid is singular one. It's absolute. So Maimonides or Ramban influenced the Jewish people so greatly that they accept his teaching above the Word of God, just like Christians in John Hagee's church will look at this piece of paper and say, well, hallelujah, he, our pastor sure did write it. Jesus must have changed the Sabbath. The, so, listen, Judaism... Orthodox Judaism, modern, not ancient, modern, Orthodox Judaism says God is singular one. He doesn't have a son. He doesn't all, you know what I'm saying? And, but what does is, what is Christianity and Protestant Christianity, they focus on three. They focused on this trinity. And so the Christian doctrine of the trinity comes from the early church fathers and was formally introduced at the Council of Nicaea in 324. This was where the bishops, pastors, and teachers began to emphasize three gods instead of the oneness, the compound unity of God that's actually found in the Scriptures. Does that make sense to everybody? Amen. Judaism changed what the Scripture said and said that there's not a unity, there's a singularity. Christianity saw the unity but said, that's not a unity, that's three. <laughs> now I'm serious. We've got to find out what does the Bible say and what is the truth and what is the Scripture. And I want to encourage you, test what I'm saying. Like 119 Ministries, go home, pray about this and read it for yourself. Go to the Bible. Don't go to YouTube unless it's our channel. Because <laughs> it's the only place you'll find the truth. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but seriously, go to our channel and watch the stuff there. Be careful out there. There's people that don't even know Hebrew. And, and like Brad Scott said, those are the ones that know his name and you're going to be saved in his name. It's not true. And man, when I was in Protestant Christianity, I heard this saying over and over and over. Now, the, the pastor would say, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, words mean things. And if you just look at that, that makes their three gods, right? The reality is there's the Father, the Son of God, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Words are important. We don't have eternal life. We have everlasting life because we had a beginning. Understand? Even things like that are important. When we got born again, we got everlasting life. From that moment, it's going to continue forever. And we got everlasting, not eternal. God's eternal. So this word, Ichad, which is one, it actually means unity. I'm going to give you some examples right in Genesis 1. God called the light day, and the darkness He called night, and the evening and the morning were one day. But um, um, here's what we see. We see light and dark, morning and evening, comprising one. Does that make sense? Everybody following me? You see how there's two things going on, but it's one day. 
And God said, Let the waters, plural, under the heaven be gathered together, many waters gathered together, into what? One place, echad. And let the dry ground appear. So again, unity, togetherness, many waters coming together. Does everybody understand? One though, same word. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be la basar echad. They will be one flesh, right? How does that happen? That happens when two become one and they make a child. And this is a side note. I just found this out for all you guys that are married or looking to get married. Uh-oh. Richard and Chris, you can be dismissed. <laughs> I won't go too deep on it, but seriously. The word cleave there is a really cool word. You know what it says? It says, guys, your wife's not supposed to pursue you, so quit thinking she is. You're supposed to pursue her. Continually pursue her. Chase her, call her, text her, give her flowers, love on her. Don't expect her to do it to you. You are the instigator. You're the giver. She's the receiver. She's the, uh, she will duplicate whatever you give her. You give her H-E double hockey sticks, you're going to get it in your house. <laughs> you give her love, peace, joy, all those things, you're going to get it back. She's a seed basket. And the word cleave, the root word for the word cleave means to sharpen. Everybody say sharpen. sharpen. This is awesome because the word sharpen is like iron sharpens iron. So as, hear, this, hear me, hear me. As the man and woman cleave, as the man chases the wife and you go pursue her, you, go, you get close, 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 your sparks are going to fly, but that's how you get sharpened and sanctified. So stay close, men. Pursue your wife. Cleave to her. And as the sparks fly, allow yourself to be sanctified. In the beginning, God created. So this is Genesis 1.1. We're talking about God being a unity. The Hebrew word God is Elohim. It's a plural noun. It gives evidence through grammar that God chose to reveal Himself as a compound unity. So Elohim is powers in the, in the, in the concrete word, is power, powers. And, um, and so it says God's created. That's what it says. Now, this is one of the most amazing prophecies in the Scripture, okay? Isaiah 9, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Did you know that's actually a name? Counselor, El Gibor, Mighty God, and the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. So here's the question. How can a child and a son be called everlasting father? How can this one that's actually going to be born through a woman called a child and a son, how can he have the same name as everlasting father? That's a deep mystery. And then it says, Of the increase of his government and their and peace, there will be no end. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and with justice from now and forevermore, the zeal of Yahweh of hosts will perform this. This is an amazing prophecy, but what we're going to focus on is the part there in green and black. Because it tells us here, unto us a child is born and a son is given. This is a messianic prophecy. Amen? Can you say amen? amen. But it says, of the increase of his government. Okay, that's what we're going to look at in Hebrew now. First, a little Hebrew lesson. This is the letter Mim. Everybody say Mim. mim. Um, so... One has a hole in it. Do you see the one with the hole in it? Okay, the other one that's like a square, that's called the, the closed mem or the final mem. Everybody say final mem. Final mem. Final mem. Now, the, the, the regular mem with the hole in it, that goes at the beginning of a word or anywhere in the middle. The closed mem or the final mem goes at the end of a word. So in Hebrew, everything's backwards from what we would do. They change... Um, letters at the end, we capitalize at the beginning. Does that make sense? This is kind of similar to that. But at the end of the word, you put the final mem. Okay? You don't, you never put the final mem in the beginning or the middle. Is everybody following me? The other mem goes at the beginning or the middle. But as Isaiah was led by the Holy Spirit to write this passage of the increase of his government, watch what he does. He writes this word, 
le marbe hamisra le marbe hamisra and and so what do you see there that's different you see in the middle of a word la merba you see that Isaiah was led by the Holy Spirit now you know he didn't misspell this he was led by the Holy Spirit to put a final mem in the middle of a word actually it's the first letter because that la is taken away the word is merba and so it's the first uh, letter of the word marbe and so um, what the scribes would do when they would write this they left it in there at the top. They left the top one how it is. They, they left the closed mem, but then they would put brackets beside it and they would write the word with the right way to write it. Is everybody following me? So Isaiah was led to put the wrong letter in there by the Lord and the scribes began to write the right letter right beside it. The word marbe means increase or abundance. And then this is just right from the Strong's. I mean, you go to, go, to, go to any search engine and you'll find this next phrase. Interestingly, the final form of the Hebrew letter mem, which belongs at the end of the word, is used in the middle of this word in Isaiah. So even, even Christian commentators are putting this in, but we just don't know what it means until now. The root word is rabbi. Everybody say rabbi. It means to become great, or many, or much, or numerous. Now, his government was going to increase. It was going to come great. It was going to overtake the whole world, the whole universe, and there would be peace, the Bible says. So, do you understand how that word means? His government was going to increase, right? The root word is Rav. Everybody say Rav. Rav. And then if you go from Rav, you can go to the word Rabbi. And actually, really famous heavyweight punching rabbis are called Ravs. So how cool is it that this word is in there, Marbe, which has the root word from the word that we get the word Rabbi, and it's all about Yeshua's government increasing. Fascinating. But as we get into it deeper, the letter Mem in the deeper Hebrew writings, the rabbis say this is a womb. The womb at the top is a womb that has had intercourse and given birth to a baby. The womb at the bottom is called a closed womb or a virgin womb. Everybody say a virgin womb. In the Zohar, the writer of the Zohar says this, The closed mem in Isaiah 9 refers to the fact that the Messiah would be born from a closed womb. Isn't that fascinating? They knew, they knew the Messiah was going to be born from a virgin. Now the Zohar has so many messianic hints in it, they say today modern, modern rabbis will tell their disciples, you can't read the Zohar, it's too deep, it'll make you go crazy. <laughs> Why? Because all of a sudden you start seeing unity of God and you see the Messiah and you see these things that point to Yeshua actually in the Zohar. And so it's fascinating because even in a prayer composed by this Reb or Rab Nasan, it's uh, he's a Breslov rabbi, and this is what they pray. Let's say a woman is giving birth to a baby. The traditional prayer says, "Open the gates of birth for her, and in your great mercy, open the closed mem of her womb." So that closed mem needs to be opened in order for a baby to come out. Isn't that fascinating? So they put that closed. Listen, y'all get that. When Isaiah wrote this, of the increase of his government, he was led by the Ruach to put a closed mem in there that the Jewish people know that means that the Messiah was going to be born for a virgin. Isn't that cool? One of those moments, Chris. Hallelujah. Therefore, Yahweh Himself will give you a sign. The virgin... Right? This is the passage right afterwards that we need to know about. Actually, it's before it in Isaiah. The virgin, the closed mem, shall conceive and bear a son. You will call his name Emmanuel. The word virgin there is ha'alma. The root word is alam. It means to be concealed. The womb is concealed, pointing us to Isaiah 9, which has the, the Hebrew letter in there, unpurposely misspelled to point to Yeshua being born. 
So how is it possible that this child that was going to be born from a closed mem, the womb would be closed, there was no intercourse, the Holy Spirit did it, and then the baby came out, right? How can this child be called the everlasting father and also a son? This is a deep mystery of God that we can't understand. Well, the only way to understand it is the Shema. Shema Israel, Yahweh, the Father, Eloheinu, God with us, the Holy Spirit, Yahweh, Echad, the Son. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one unity. When it says Eloheinu there, it's our God. Okay? And so even in the Shema, when you say Yahweh, Eloheinu, Yahweh, Echad, you're seeing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is Eloheinu, our God, the God that's with us inside that brings Yeshua to us, that brings us into relationship with the Father. Psalm 16 says this, I will bless Yahweh who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set Yahweh always before me because He's at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory, my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer the Holy One to see corruption. This is a prophetic psalm written about Yeshua. Okay? Now check this out. It's talking about Yahweh in the top. And then he goes on and calls Yahweh the Holy One. Does everybody understand that? Acts 2 is fascinating, connecting that with that. Talking about Yeshua that God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that He should be held by it. For David says concerning Him, and that whole psalm is quoted in Acts 2, right? And he says Yeshua, he's saying Yeshua is the Holy One. Does everybody understand that? Yeshua, when He died, He was not left in the grave. Why? He came out. Amen? So the Holy One, Yahweh, was not left in the grave. He came out. And then he says, Foreseeing this, he spoke concerning of the resurrection of the Messiah. So this whole prophecy in Psalms 16 is requoted in the New Testament about Yeshua. Now check this out. The Holy One in Psalm 16, see that at the bottom? The Holy One is called Yahweh. His soul was not left in the grave in the New Testament. And David wrote about him and said that that one called Yahweh, whose soul was not left in the grave, he says that prophecy was written about Yeshua. But Yeshua's name, here's what I want you to see. Listen, Yeshua's name's not in there. Whose name is in there? Yahweh. Okay. Now, Psalm 89. This is going to make you think about your Bible in a whole new way. Okay? What I, here's the point. I'm just going to jump ahead. There's only been, from the book of Genesis to the Revelation, one mediator between God and man. It's Yeshua. Yeshua, for, the Messiah. The pre-incarnate Messiah in the Old Testament in the Tanakh was called Yahweh. That was His name. And in the New Testament, the Word of Yahweh is another name for Yeshua. He became flesh and dwelt among us all the new, all the way through. The whole book's about Yeshua. It's about the Messiah. No man has ever seen the Father. If you, so, so the Father had relationship through, with humans through the Son from the beginning to the end. And we're going to prove that to you. Listen. Psalm 89. This is going to show you clearly at the end, you're going to see that the one that gave the law to Moses on the mountain was Yeshua, it wasn't the Father. And when Yeshua in the New Testament says, keep my commands, you're going to know it goes, takes you all the way back to Deuteronomy and Exodus. And I'm just going to show you the Scriptures, this. Our shield belongs to Yahweh our King, the Holy One of Israel. Okay, now look. In Acts 2, the Holy One of Israel was called, what? Yeshua. By the way, I learned... About half of this stuff from a teaching Eddie Chumney did about eight, nine years ago, which just blew my mind. It opened me up. It's like, I got to go reread the whole Old Testament. Wow. It's fascinating. Our shield belongs to Yahweh, our King, the Holy One of Israel. So in Psalm 89, check this out. 
The one called the Holy One is called Yahweh and also called our King. Does that make sense? And we just saw in Acts, quoting from the other psalm, that that one called the Holy One was Yeshua, right? Revelation 19, He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and His name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed Him on white horses. Who's this about? Yeshua. And at the bottom, what is another name for Yeshua? The what? King of kings and the Lord of lords. So Yeshua is called the Word of God. He's called the Holy One. He's called the King. He's called the King of kings. He's called the Lord of lords. And He is also called Yahweh all through the Old Testament. The word of the Lord Yahweh that came to the prophets in the Tanakh in the Old Testament was Yeshua. How do we know that? What does it say in John? In the beginning was the? Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So when you read all the prophets, and the prophets continually say, The Word of the Lord came to me, that was Yeshua coming to speak to the prophets. How do we know that? Because His name is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us as Emmanuel. And then I put in there, and right beside that, I put the word Eloheinu, which again comes from the Shema, which the only way that God could come and be Eloheinu, our God, with us, is through the Holy Spirit. Understand? Because Yeshua physically, Yeshua physically has tangible matter that you can touch. You know that, right? You know one day when He comes back, you will be able to touch the man. You know that. That's deep, man. That's deep that the one that went up, they saw Him go up. They touched Him. John said, I handled Him. I touched Him. Everlasting eternal life, I touched and handled it, man. And he wrote to give us hope. And they said, that same one that went up, he's coming back down in a body. A physical man is going to be on the throne of David. Forever Yeshua decided to take on flesh for us. It is awesome. And so he can't climb in you himself, but by the Holy Spirit, he's in us. We're His body. Isaiah 41 says this, Fear not, you worm. God's talking to His Son. You ever get upset when your dad calls you a name? Well, has he called you a worm yet? Fear not, you worm, Jacob, and men of Israel. I will help you says Yahweh your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Now, here's what we're going to see. Yahweh here is called the Redeemer and the Holy One. So we saw already that the Holy One was Yeshua. Now we're seeing His name's Yahweh, and we're seeing He's the Redeemer. Who's the Redeemer? Is the Father the Redeemer? The Father sent the Son to redeem us. Right? So the one that is our Redeemer is called the Holy One of Israel and also called Yahweh. Our Redeemer is Yeshua. The Holy One is Yeshua. The King of Kings is Yeshua. And the Word of Yahweh is Yeshua. Y'all getting all this? And Yeshua is called Yahweh in the Tanakh. The early, early mystical Jewish writers saw this before Ramban. You remember we learned Ramban, Maimonides. See, Maimonides, the Jewish rabbis did what the Protestant pastors did. They took what the Scripture says and made their own thing out of it, and people go to that instead of the Word. As a matter of fact, they're not allowed to read portions of Isaiah and Zechariah, because Zechariah says, They will look on me, the one you pierced, and mourn. And so the early mystical rabbis that would fast and pray and they just had the Bible, 
They looked in the Old Testament, and here's what they said. They said, there's two Yahwehs in there. And you can read their writings, and they said, there's a greater Yahweh and a lesser Yahweh. They didn't understand the Father and the Son. But they realized some places in one scripture, there's two beings called Yahweh. Doing different things. We're not going to get into that here. It's a whole other teaching, but if you go to our, our website, you can see the teachings we've done on how there's two in one verse. It's fascinating. But what we see is the Father and the Son in the Old Testament. What did Yeshua say? I come in my Father's what? Name. Name. Now Isaiah 43, I am Yahweh your God, the Holy One of Israel. Now He's called your Savior. So now Yahweh's called the Holy One of Israel, and now He's called the Savior. So who's our Savior? Yeshua. And then in Isaiah 47, As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is His name, the Holy One of Israel. So now, the one called the Redeemer is given a name. What is the Redeemer's name? Right here, though. The Lord of hosts. Here's what's fascinating. When you read in the Bible about the Lord of hosts, we're told by Isaiah 47 that it's one, the Lord of hosts is the Holy One of Israel and the Redeemer. How many of you have just read over these things before? I, until I really dug in and studied this, the Lord of hosts to me was always the Father. I'm showing you here the compound unity of God and the oneness of God and the relationship between the Father and the Son having the same name. I'm showing you that the whole Bible is about Yeshua. I'm showing you that when Yeshua would come to people in the Old Testament and reveal Himself, He was coming as Yahweh, the Holy One, the Redeemer, the Savior, and the Lord of hosts. Deuteronomy says this, Yahweh came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone from Mount Paran. He came with 10,000 saints. From His right hand came what? A fiery Torah. So this is Yahweh. Who's this about? Everybody say Yahweh. Yahweh. Didn't it say that? So this says that Yahweh came with 10,000 saints. And it says when He came, He's going to have a fiery Torah at His side. And then it says this, they will sit down at your feet and receive your words. Okay? This scripture tells us that Yahweh comes with 10,000 saints. What does Jude say? Jude talks about Yeshua being the one that comes with 10,000 saints. Right? Revelation 19 talks about Yeshua coming with the saints on horses dressed with white robes. Okay? There they are. And it also says that the Torah came from this same one, from His right hand, this one had a fiery Torah. And it says, saints, sit at His feet and receive it. It's fascinating. Because you think about Mount Sinai and the millions of people that were at the base of Mount Sinai when Yeshua was there with Moses. He was called Yahweh. He was there on the mountain giving the Torah. There was people standing, some sitting. And then if you look in the New Testament, Yeshua had people sitting at His feet listening to Him all the time. So that passage there from Deuteronomy talking about Yahweh having people sitting at His feet is also about Yeshua. Isaiah 5 says this, Therefore as the fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root will be as rottenness and their, their blossom will ascend like dust. Because they have rejected the Torah... Of the Lord of hosts. Who did we see the Lord of hosts was? Yeshua. Now this passage tells us that the Torah belongs to the one in the Old Testament called the Lord of hosts. This goes against 90% of Christian pastors' theology. Why? Because they've been influenced by Marcion. Marcion, what did he teach? He said that in the Old Testament, the Father was there. The Father was like this tough guy that gave lots of rules to the people. And they said that, but one day he sent his son down. And his son came and said, basically, in essence, you don't have to listen to dad. I'm here now, you listen to me. 
study Marcion's writing. From Marcion, we got New Testament only Bibles. Did you know that's why we have Bibles that are New Testament only? Because his theology wanted to get rid of the whole Old Testament. Why? Because, oh, it's too hard to understand. But the reality is that same one that gave the Torah on the mountain is the New Testament, Yeshua. So Yeshua is the Word of Yahweh. He's called the Redeemer. He's called the Holy One of Israel. He's called the Savior. He's called the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's called the Lord of Hosts. He's the owner and the giver of the Torah. The law, the Torah, is His. Isn't that amazing? Now it says in Isaiah, For Yahweh is our judge, Yahweh is our lawgiver, Yahweh is our king, He will save us. That He will save us is Yehushenu. Everybody say Yehushenu. Um, basically, um, that has the root word of Yasha. And you could translate that last phrase there, He will save us, as Yeshua, as Yeshua our Savior. So Yahweh is our judge, Yahweh is our lawgiver, Yahweh is our king, Yeshua, our Savior, is right there in the Hebrew. Amen? So Yeshua is the mediator between God and man. And in James 4.12 it says this, There's only one lawgiver who is able to save. And he was quoting again from this place in Isaiah 33. So if Yeshua is the lawgiver... Listen, you've got to put all these pieces together to get this, okay? But if Yeshua really is the lawgiver, that completely changes our understanding of the New Testament because Protestant pastors that don't understand the New Testament, they say, when Yeshua says, keep my commands, they say, well, it's only the commands you find in the New Testament primarily love one another. But if they understand that Yeshua is the one that gave the Torah... He's Yahweh Tzavah, the Lord of hosts. Then they would understand that all of the commands are still relevant. Now listen, we're not sacrificing animals. There's no temple. There's a whole, man, there's a lot of commands we can't even keep today. So don't let anybody tell you you got to keep all the commands. You cannot keep some of the commands. Some of the commands are for women, some are for men, some are for priests, Right? But there are commands that do apply to us today. Those are the ones we keep. Sabbath, the feast, food. How do you treat one another? Love. Those are all in there. Hold your question. I'll, I'll get to it at the end, okay? Yeshua was the one on the mountain um, with Moses. And the Bible says that, uh, listen to this. Moses went up with Aaron, Nadav, and Abihu. The 70 elders also went up, and they saw the God of Israel. Listen, Exodus 24. The elders go up on the mountain, and it says they saw the God of Israel. In the New Testament, I'm going to show you later, Yeshua said nobody's ever seen the Father. So how did they see the God of Israel? They saw Yeshua. Listen. And they said, under his feet was pavement. Does the Father have feet? No. He's a light. He's bigger than the universe. He made the universe. He does not have feet. The Father doesn't have feet. But Yeshua, even before he came as a man, Yeshua came and had these feet. We cannot understand this stuff. So Yeshua has always been the mediator between God and man. Yeshua was the one on the mountain with Moses. The elders saw His feet. They actually ate with Him. Can you eat with the Father? Not right now. Does God have feet? No, He's a spirit. Genesis 18. Man, I brought this up to my Orthodox brother... A uh, friend of mine, and and uh, we had a really good talk about this one in Genesis 18. It says, Yahweh, who? Yahweh. Appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre. And this is about Avram, Abraham. As he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So who appeared to Abraham? Yahweh. He lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, now it tells us, not Yahweh, it says, three men are there. You read the story, it says 
Two of the men left. How many? Two. Went towards Sodom. Abraham then stood before Yahweh. That tells us if three men came, two of them were angels. We read later, the two angels go and they destroy Sodom, right? That means that if three men came, one of them were Yahweh, two leave, the one standing there was called Yahweh in the Old Testament, called the Lord of hosts, the Redeemer. That was Yeshua. How does Yeshua say? He said, Abraham, man, he rejoiced at my day. They had a relationship, family. Listen, I know this may be hard for some of you to just even swallow or understand. This, this, this took many years of studying and prayer to even be able to teach or understand. And I still don't understand God. Don't get me wrong. Don't think I know God. I don't know Him. I know Him, but He is so much beyond me, I can't figure Him out. And somebody tries to tell you they got it all figured out. They don't have it all figured out. Listen, the fringes of His garment, it says in Job, displays so much wisdom, His manifold wisdom. And all we've ever even seen of God, according to Job, is His zitzit. We haven't even got to God's essence. Above the firm, this is Ezekiel, this is another passage Orthodox rabbis don't want their people reading. Above the firm and over their heads was the likeness of a throne, and in the appearance of it was like sapphire. And the likeness of the throne was the likeness and the appearance of a man. His waist, his waist, it says again, and it talks about this man having the glory of the Lord, which is the glory of Yahweh. Who is this on the throne? Who's the, who did Ezekiel see? Saw Yeshua sitting on a throne with all the living creatures. Why? Because the Father cannot break into our dimension unless He's coming as the Son. Okay? Listen, Billy Graham did an amazing um, uh, teaching just to try to explain the Father and the Son and how the Father uh, became a human. Here's what he said. I read this years ago. It made a lot of sense. He said, if you had a collection of ants, and this is going to be silly, but I want you to hear this. He said, if you had a collection of ants and you saw them walking over a cliff and just falling down and dying, he said, what would you do? If you put your hand down there, they're going to climb right over your hand and jump off the cliff. He said, you could talk to them. They ain't going to get it because you're speaking human and they're ants. If you had power, you would become an ant. You go down and be like, hey guys, quit jumping off the edge. The Father, only way He can communicate with sinful men is through the Son. When Adam and Eve ate off the tree in the garden, things changed. They had a relationship. And if you read the Hebrew in Genesis, it says at one point they're talking to God and it says that after sin, it says the voice of Yahweh echoed and walked through the garden. No longer was there a communication between God and man. They were using the voice of God had to come and walk, which is Yeshua. The whole relationship and dynamic has changed because of sin. And so what did Yeshua do? He came to redeem us, change us, and give us access to the Father, which is awesome. I mean, you close your eyes. You don't even have to close your eyes. Talk to the Father. You can talk to the Father now. And one day we're going to see Him in His glory. We're going to see Yeshua. The whole thing It's not going to be mysterious anymore. We won't know Him but we'll get to see Him and hang out with Him. We'll never understand Him fully. So Yahweh comes to Abraham as a man. The glory of the Lord looked like a man to Ezekiel. Remember the four men in the furnace, remember? One was like the Son of God. Psalm 20, We rejoice in your salvation, and in the name of our God we will set up our banners. Yahweh fulfills our petitions. You retranslate that into the literal Hebrew, taking out the additions there. It says, We rejoice in your Yeshua, salvation, Yeshua T, in the name of our God. Behold, look at Yahweh. That's fascinating. Rejoicing in Yeshua. So according to Psalm 20, Yeshua is the name of God. Do you understand that? We rejoice in your salvation and in the name of our God. We will set up our banners. But in Hebrew it says, We rejoice in your Yeshua. Then it says, The name of our God. We rejoice in Yeshua. The name of our God. Everybody get that? 
There are actually Orthodox Jews getting saved just reading the Torah and the prayer books. Because everywhere you see the word deliverance, salvation, um, any words that are similar to that, it's Yeshua's name in Hebrew. It says Yeshua. This is it. This is. Listen, if you want a knockout punch, here it goes. This seals it. Yahweh is my strength and song and has what? What did I say the word salvation is? Yeshua. Again in Isaiah 12, Behold, God is my Yeshua. I will trust and not be afraid because Yah, Yahweh is my strength and song and has become my Yeshua. Do you get it? The Yahweh of the Old Testament becomes the Yeshua of the New Testament. Through, Isaiah 9 says, the closed mem of a virgin. It's fascinating. That's exactly right. So my salvation, when you, if you were to read that in Hebrew and just trans... If you were to phonetically say it, it's Yeshua T. Say Yeshua T. When you add a T at the end, it's my, you're saying my, and then you have the word Yeshua. So my salvation in Hebrew is Yeshua T. So Yahweh has become Yeshua. What does John 8 say? And Yeshua speaking, He said, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. What's God's name? I am. John 10, He says, I and my Father are one. The Father is in me and I'm in Him. In John 14, If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. From now on you know Him and have seen Him. Now have we seen the Father? No. But when we see Yeshua... We see the Father. He does everything the Father does. He's a mirror. Psalm 2 says, I will declare this decree. Yahweh says to me, You are my son. This day I have begotten you. Everybody say begotten. Begotten, begotten does not mean make or create. The word begotten means to be brought forth out of the midst of as a representation. So when the Son was begotten of the Father, He was brought forth from the essence of, an exact copy of, Yahweh in the flesh is Yeshua. That's begotten. So Yeshua is not a created being. Understand that. There's doctrine out there trying to just even say Yeshua was made at a certain point in history. If He was made, listen, He's so close to the Father that He's called the Word of God. And you cannot separate you from your words because your words, are first thing they are is your thoughts. Before you can speak, you've got to think. So the Father and the Son are so intimate, they're like thoughts. When, when Yahweh speaks, it's Yeshua. And Yahweh at one point begot a son. You can't understand it. And then in Proverbs 30 it says, What is his name and what is his son's name, if you know? Most people have no idea that is even in Proverbs. Most people don't know his name or his son's true name. So here... We're seeing the Father and the Son. Do you see that? How many are there? Two. Men, the apostolic Protestants, the apostolic Pentecostals, they say that, that Yeshua is talking about Himself right there. They are so oneness that they don't understand the Father and the Son. And when Yeshua is praying to the Father, they say, well, He's just talking to Himself. He's doing it for a show. It is not what's going on. How is it possible that the child that was going to be born of a closed womb will be called everlasting father and a son? Again, because Shema Israel, Yahweh the Father, the first one is the Father, the second one Elohim is the Holy Spirit, and the third one is Yeshua. Listen, I didn't even put this in here. Go to the internet and type in Zohar slash how can three be one? The earliest rabbis just reading the Shema 
They said God's name's in there three times. We can't figure it out. God must be some kind of unity of three. They write that. That's not Christian. And so listen, I want everybody to understand, there's nothing wrong with understanding properly the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's actually 100% scriptural. People get into this movement and they want to just throw everything Christian out. Well, that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to test it. If it lines up with Scripture, we leave it. The Father and the Son are one God. This word, uh, this word one in Hebrew is unity, okay? So Yeshua is the Word, the Redeemer, the Holy One, the Savior, the King of Kings, the Lord of Hosts. He gives the Torah. He owns the Torah. And some places, in, even in that Scripture, He's called Everlasting Father. How? Because He came forth from the Father to show us the Father. And He's also the only begotten Son. We're going, to look at, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit real quick, and then we're going to close. About five minutes, okay? I want to show you the Holy Spirit in the Scripture. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. In Genesis, you see God, which is plural, and you see the Holy Spirit right there. Okay? It doesn't say the Father was floating over the water. It doesn't say the Word of God was floating over the water. It says the Ruach Elohim, Spirit of God. Right there, you see God, plural, and the Holy Spirit. Now listen to this. This is fascinating. This throws people that don't understand the Holy Spirit's role in the Godhead. They say that the Holy Spirit, they don't, they don't understand the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. Peter says, why... To, to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to who? And keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, it wasn't it yours after it was sold? Was it not yours? Why have you conceived this in your heart? And why have you lied not to men but to? All right. The Holy Spirit right there is called God. Y'all see that? Is the Holy Spirit some essence Something that's not God? No. The Holy Spirit is God, just like the Father and the Son. How do you know? If you just can't understand, read that, it's real clear. When they lied to the Holy Spirit, they were lying to God. Luke says this, The Holy Spirit descended in, descended in a bodily form like a dove upon who? Who did the Holy Spirit come down on? Looked like a dove, right? And then a voice, say a voice, voice, came from heaven and said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. The one that's Pentecostals believe Yeshua was throwing His voice in ventriloquism right there. But this place, you see the whole Godhead right there. You, see the fa you hear the Father's voice, you see the Son, and you see the Holy Spirit. So is there a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Yes. yes. Are they three individual gods? No. Are they one? Yes. Okay? John bore witness to this and he said, I saw who? The Holy Spirit descending like a dove on who? Yeshua. Alright. I will pray to the Father and He will give you, what's that say? Another say another. Alright, so you got the Father and the Son, and then you got one called another by Yeshua. He's saying there's another one. That's awesome. He says, I gotta go up there. I'm gonna go to the Father, and when I get there, I'm gonna send the Ruach to you. The world cannot receive because it neither knows him, sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you. The Holy Spirit was with the apostles. And He will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. How does Yeshua come? Through the Holy Spirit. Like I said before, Yeshua is a man with a physical body. Right? I believe He's also omniscient and omnipresent. Okay? But He's in a place. The only way He gets in us is by His Spirit. And He does that at the same time. Because He's God. John 14, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit... Now here we go. We're going to see the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit right here. Again, I'm not telling you there's three gods. There's one God. But there is a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
the Helper, the Holy Spirit, it's very clear, who's that? The Holy Spirit. Whom the Father will send in my name. Yeshua speaking. Yeshua Himself teaching. As Brother Arnold would say, you're not fighting me, you're fighting the Bible. I'm just presenting scriptures, and I don't understand everything I'm telling you. Okay? I'm just sharing the Bible. My point in all this, this is an important doctrine to understand, because there are people out there in our movement that have completely de 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 denied that there's three why? Because they're so scared of Catholic, Catholicism. They're so scared that so many Protestant p preachers really focus and make their emphasis Trinity instead of one. And so all of a sudden, all this stuff that is actually legitimately Scripture that we learn from Christianity, they want to throw it all out. We're not to do that. Christianity taught us the gospel. We are saved by faith through grace. Christianity taught us that there's a Father, Son, and a Holy Spirit, right? Some of us learned about the movement of the Pentecostal, you know, how to, how to flow in the Spirit. We learned that. So we don't come into this and throw everything out. We come into this, we put everything on the shelf, and then we re-examine things one at a time. And if it lines up with Scripture, we keep it. Right? So Yeshua says there's a Father and a Son, and He's the one talking. Okay? Yeshua nowhere said that there's a trinity of three gods, though. Right? Okay. And then in John 15, he says the same thing. When the Helper, who's the Helper? The Holy Spirit comes, that I, Yeshua, I'm going to send from the Father. How many is that? Are they three gods? No. How do we know? Because the primary... Listen, if you were to go into Judaism, I know this, I was trained by a rabbi. The most important command in Judaism is what we call the Shema. We don't even think of it as a command. What did, when Yeshua was asked, what's the most important command, what did He say? Huh? He did not start there. You know what He said? What's the most important command? He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He started with the most important command that we just think is a phrase, but the most important command is this. God is one, but within there there's three. The unity of God is a command to know and understand God. You understand? So when Yeshua was asked, what's the most important command? He says, Hear, O Israel, Lord our God, the Lord is one. Judaism looks at that as a command to know the oneness of God. They just make it singular instead of compound. Understand? And so there we have the Shema. The Father. No one has ever seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father has declared Him. So, I, so the only way that we know the Father is through the Son. The Father Himself uh, has sent me. You, you've never seen Him or seen His form or heard Him. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws Him, and I'll raise Him up on the last day. Amen? And then at the bottom, not that anyone has seen the Father except who, the one that's from God. He's seen the Father. He's talking about Himself. Amen? Amen? Philip says, show us the Father. And Yeshua says, man, I've been with you so long and you don't know me. He said, me. You understand this? We cannot figure this out. He says, show me the Father. Yeshua says, man, I've been hanging out with you. You don't know me? If you, anybody that's seen me, seen the Father. So how can you sh say, show me the Father? I and my Father are? Okay. So again, the way we understand the unity of God in here is that there's only one God. But within God, I've shown you through the Scriptures that there's a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit. Right? Okay. We don't believe there's three. We believe there's one. But we do believe there's distinctly a Father, Son, and a Holy Spirit. Alright? We believe here that... From Genesis to Revelation, the interaction with man was done by the Son. Today, we're dealing with the Son, but we're dealing with the Son through the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has come to show us the Son, and the Son comes to show us the Father. 
So we are able to go to the Father through the Spirit, by the Son, we enter into His presence. Okay? Hallelujah. Amen. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for teaching us. Thank You for Shabbat. Hallelujah. Give us rest today. Give us peace today. Continue to open Your Word and teach us Your ways. And bless us this week in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Yahweh is working His vineyard Grafting the wild branch in Oh, what a joyous occasion To be counted worthy of Him Lift up your hands and praise Him Lift up your voice and praise Him